Aviant, where I create and implement our reputation and brand strategies. I also serve on my company's Inclusion and Diversity Council, helping my fellow Team Navient members leverage diversity and equity strategies, such as what we will be learning today when we're navigating in the Generations Workplace event to continue fostering an inclusive and forward-thinking environment. Navient is headquartered right here at the Riverfront, and we're best known for our student loan servicing, but we provide a range of other services for local, state, and federal government and healthcare institutions. I'm also part of the Delaware Young Professional Network, Woo! the group that is hosting this event. We're also known as DYPN for short. We help young professionals such as myself and others build their, develop, their professional development and business networks with events that include one such as this. I moved to Delaware back in 2018 for the, my position at Navian. And so the DYPN group uh, introduced me to most of the business networks I have now and helped me develop a connection a relationship with the community here in Delaware as a transplant. So we'd like to thank the Navient Foundation for sponsoring this event. Navient gives back to the communities that we live, work, and play in through the Navient Foundation, employee volunteerism, and employee donations. Today, we're pleased to have Judah Holland, the Senior Director of Strategic Initiatives at Navient, moderate this event. I have the privilege of working with Judah through the Inclusion and Diversity Council, where she fearlessly leads it. I'm excited to work with Judah in this capacity. So Judah, can you share a little bit more about yourself? Sure, thank you and good morning, everybody. Um, thank you for inviting me into your space. I'm actually a Hoosier from Indiana. <laughs> so thank you for letting me come and pretend like I'm a, a Delawarean <laughs> um, today. Um, so as, as she mentioned, um, I am with Navient. Um, I'm the senior director of our strategic initiatives um, and I chair our Inclusion, Diversity, and Equity Council. Um, <clears throat> I, I am also a Gen Xer, so for frame of reference, um, but I have been with Navient for 25 years. And um, I just a little bit of background about me. I, I started off as a mail clerk, um, opening mail and opening claims. So whenever people couldn't pay their student loan and there was a claim filed, I, I got to open and process the mail, and that was way before technology. So <laughs> you were literally opening up mail, literally reading things. Um, and I've grown professionally since I've been there. Um, so now in my role, um, I help our organization identify ways to, tr to strategically grow. So it's everything from our five-year strategic plan to um, ways that we can um, expand our footprint across the organization, um, looking at ways that we can optimize our expenses, the way that we can improve our relationships with our clients and our customers. So it's a very broad stroke in terms of the role that I support today. Um, <clears throat> I Probably my favorite part of my job is, is participating on the Inclusion and Diversity Chair. Um, <clears throat> it's a great opportunity to really um, engage with people sort of at the grassroots level. And because I'm not an HR, um, I can come at it with a completely different perspective. And that's probably the, the best part of, of, that, um, of that role. Um, I, Helena and I were talking about this yesterday. Um, I, I got an interest in these type of topics of inclusion, diversity, and equity, and things like that. I would say it first started because um, I had both a niece and a nephew who have Down syndrome, um, one of which who was adopted from China uh, when she was seven years old. And then um, we had a lot of transition with all of that. But when that event happened with our family, our whole family, not just my sister and her husband, had to think about inclusion in a whole different m mindset. We had to think about a whole new set of vocabulary. We had to think about words that were inclusive and words that were not inclusive. And we really just had to sort of think about how we interact and connect with people at a very different way than we did, did before. And then sort of progressing onto that um, over the years, probably around I don't know, 2014 or so, um, I started really having a passion for racial reconciliation. Um, and so I started participating and volunteering with an organization and traveling to Rwanda, Africa, um, several times a year to conduct leadership training for local women on both um, economic development, 
uh, leadership uh, skills, as well as being um, mediation training for both tribal and racial reconciliation. And so I think all of that together has put me to a place where I, I, I try to see people as individuals um, and remove probably barriers that might uh, maybe stereotypically keep us apart. Um, so I think this is a really relevant topic today and I, I commend you guys for even trying to have this conversation because there is a difference between generations and the way we think, there is a difference in generations, the way we operate, the way we were raised. Um, I, I mentioned I was a Gen Xer and <clears throat> this morning I was looking up uh, historical things that happened <laughs> for Gen X and, and, and there were things like the Berlin Wall coming down but then we also have like the highest divorce rate. I mean, you know, the, so all kinds of odd things in our generation, but all of those things really do play a part to how we communicate, how we build connection with each other, how we collaborate um, and how we get along and how we um, are able to agree and disagree so, in a civil manner. So again, thank you for allowing me to come to this place today and be with you. Um, so let's turn it over to our panelists to allow them uh, to introduce themselves by giving their name, um, their occupation, and um, wh what generational spread they're in right now, and any other uh, factoids that might be in interesting. So maybe, Mike, I'll start off with you. Thanks, Julie. I'm having trouble finding my mute button. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. I am, like Judah, I'm extremely excited to be here today. It's funny, Judah was talking about some of the things in the, in the gen, Generation X, and what came to my mind was, this is the generation, I think, where we were influenced by, um, by, the, by the Clinton scandal, by, um, by, the, by, the, by, the Iran, by the Iran hostage crisis. And anyway, it's just a bunch of things that happened. Um, but anyway, I am... Um, a vice president in the human resources department at Navient. So I work with um, Brianna and with Judah. Um, and I have oversight over functions like compensation and benefits and, and work very, very heavily and closely with the IND Council and in really moving and, and evolving our IND culture at Navient. Um, originally from Virginia, I've been in Wilmington for about 10 years now. Um, we moved, I moved up here with my family when uh, when Navient moved its headquarters from Virginia up to Wilmington, Delaware. So um, in, in HR, we, we consider the generation impact in just about everything we do, whether it's evaluating, communicating, um, benefit offerings, or how do we best train and develop our employees? How do we create a more inclusive workforce? So how do we help our leaders become more inclusive leaders? Um, all, all of those things really have a huge gen generational component attached to it. So something we're always keep in the back of our minds. Um, and so in doing that, I'm really, ha really happy to, um, to participate in this venture today. I think, it's, I think as Judy mentioned, it's a great topic and I look forward to the conversation. And by the way, I am, right on the border of Gen X and a boomer. But today I'm putting on my Gen X hat and I'm gonna be a Gen Xer. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. Nice to have you here with us. Um, Anisha, do you wanna introduce yourself? Sure, thank you, Judah, and good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Anisha Truesdale and I am the program director here at the YMCA in Wilmington, Delaware. So I get the wonderful opportunity to work with many of our team programs. So um, I am the director for our Black Achievers program, our youth and government program, along with our global teens program. So I spend 90% of my day um, with teenagers, um, teenagers uh, but I also get the opportunity to work with many different generations um, here throughout the YMCA. So whether it's employment or the volunteer work, um, I do have that wonderful opportunity to engage with many different generations. Um, I've been in the youth development field for about 10, 11 years, and I'm located to Delaware uh, about three and a half years ago from Atlanta, Georgia. Um, I'm originally from Washington, D.C., so I'm really excited to be here. Um, I am a true millennial, um, a proud one. <laughs> so uh, I'm happy to engage in the great conversation today. Um, so that's a little bit about myself. Thank you, Judah. 
Thank you, and welcome also. And last on our panel this morning, we have Rob. Good morning, everybody. I'm Rob Epps. I'm the president of Junior Achievement of Delaware, and I'm also a product of this organization. I'm a native Delawarean, and I attended um, Newark High School, where I got involved with Junior Achievement as a young person, and it, it came into my life uh, at a time when I needed some adult role models who weren't my parents or my older siblings or my teachers, uh, people who didn't have to be there and weren't being paid to be there to take an interest in me. So every day when I come to work, I feel like I'm giving back to an organization that that helped me. And, and that was done by crossing bridging gaps across generations. Uh, Organizationally, today we reach students from kindergarten all the way to 12th grade. And every interaction that takes place involves an adult volunteer uh, interacting with a classroom of students or with a small group, uh, either in the workplace, at the school, or here at our J campus in Wilmington. And the, those kind of um, cross-generational conversations, if you will, happen by taking, you know, giving the adults some structure uh, to take with them to have confidence in what's going to be accomplished when they're with young people. And remember, all the way down to kindergarten. And then the idea is we want the volunteer, the adult in the room, to connect with those young people by identifying kind of, you know, meeting them where they are at that moment, somewhere between where they are at that moment and, and what their dreams are. And, and then relate at, to whatever the task is at hand through structured interactions. Uh, I am a, an official boomer, baby boomer. I was born in 1964. Um, I'm not trying to claim to be anything uh, you know, later than that, in terms of generation, I'm, I guess I'm a proud boomer. I'm the youngest of six kids, so I was raised in a house full of hippies and parties and whatnot. So I, I, I definitely have a, a boomer influence that I bring to probably ever, every interaction, be that positive or negative. So I'm really delighted to be invited and uh, to join you here. Thank you so much. Thanks, Judah. Thanks, Rob. Um, so thank you to all three of our panelists today. So let's go ahead and um, sort of switch over and open it up um, to dive into our topics. Um, we thought we would start off, <clears throat> now that we know we've got a couple boomers, Gen Xers, and millennial and things like that, <clears throat> I think everyone on the phone probably knows that with each of those generations, there are probably stereotypes. Um, things that are probably true or untrue that each of us probably um, knowingly or unknowingly assume about that genera generation. So um, I thought with the first question, maybe Mike, if you want to start us off, what, are, what do you think are some of the stereotypes or characteristics that you've heard about in your generation? And do you think they're accurate? Thanks, Judah. Um, so interesting, let me start by saying, um, I, I wanna reiterate on something Judah mentioned earlier. And that is, when we think about generations, they really are shaped by a bunch of things, whether it's, it's world events or, or environmental influences or family dynamics. In a lot of cases, a generation just wants to be different than that parent's generation. And so when I think about the stereotypes of being a Gen Xer, I'm gonna actually, revert back to the vantage point of my sons who are millennials. They would say that, well, first they would say I'm old as dirt, but secondly, they would say that we are uh, workaholics, sort of stuck in traditional ways and definitely not technology savvy. Um, and I would say when it comes to work, when it comes to the workplace, we, we tend to be loyalists. We, we tend to want to stay with the company for a while. Um, and we like to work smarter. Um, we like to work, as Rob mentioned, boomers, I think, they, they just work hard. We like to work hard, but we like to try and figure out how to do it smarter. Um, my sons would also say that they blame our generation for some of the negative stereotypes that they have. 
Um, for example, they would say that because we overcompensated, um, trying to give our kids everything, trying to give them all the opportunities, trying to trying to instill that trophy generation that we actually are the reason they have negative stereotypes. Well, anyway, so we get that blame every day. But I would say um, in, in some of the cases, some of the stereotypes are true. I do believe that we um, tend to want to work hard and we, and we really do abide our call by, 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 by societal norms. If, if the job says be here from nine to five, we are here from nine to five. We're not really, we sometimes not, don't have that work-life balance. Um, anyway, so I, I think most of the stereotypes are true, um, but I think they can be exaggerated sometimes. Yeah, so that's, that's a good point. And, and Anisha, I'm, I, as a millennial, I'm, and I'm curious your perspective on this, because I think, Mike, you hit on something that I think is very true, is I think, I think older generations, because of influences around them, how they were raised, where they were raised, and the events that were happening, have a very different view on what work commitment looks like, whether it's the traditional time you spend, how you spend that time, how you approach your work, um, and, and that that concept. So, I'm, Anisha, I'm curious your perspective about what, from a millennial perspective, is are there characteristics that you you know or stereotypes that are out there, and how do you feel about those in, in contrast to what you think is true? Well, Mike, I would have to agree with your son um, on a few of those. <laughs> um, we are not loyalists. Um, I think we oftentimes have one foot in a job and one foot out. Uh, we kind of get what we can from this particular position. And then from that, we're like, what's next? What's next? Um, how do we continue to grow? Um, one thing, I, and I do think that is very true. I see it, um, I see it with myself. I see it with my colleagues and my peers. Um, we're just trying to always figure out how do we climb that ladder. It's funny, you, you mentioned trophies. I read a quote not too long ago, and it said, millennials, we received so many participation trophies um, when we were young that 40% of us believe that we should be promoted every two years, regardless of performance. And that is true. Uh, <laughs> um, and so unfortunately, those one of those stereotypes that um, are negative. However, um, that's what we strive for. Um, we strive to move up. We, should, we strive for that recognition. Um, one of the things I would say is that we're, we're too, um, I mean, we're called, we, we have a sense of entitlement, unfortunately, um, but I do think millennials are very, very hard workers. Um, we work hard, and one of the things I may disagree with some of my millennial um, peers is that I think we, we too, we have, we don't have work-life balance. We kind of integrate our work, uh, social work and life. Um, so we we will answer an email at 11 o'clock or early in the morning. Um, so I think we, we struggle with balancing that balance as well um, because we're very passionate about what we do. Um, and we want to make sure that when we do it, we do it well. And so we will kind of put in it all to make sure that we look, our work is well, our work is done well, and we look well doing it. So. I, I, I agree with your son, Mike, on some of those things. And I, I, I agree that unfortunately we do get that negative rep um, of being a millennial, but I do think a lot of those things are very positive um, and we're very, very hard workers. That's interesting. Do you, do you think it's our fault? Of course. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm gonna hop in here too. Yes, it absolutely is. We had to get it from somewhere. <laughs> I mean, who raised us? I mean, come on now. Well, I, so Rob, I'm curious your perspective, especially in your role um, at Junior Achievement, working with so many teens. You know, how do how do you you know how do you sort of blend the the strengths of all these generations? You know, the the the, the loyal, the commitment of the boomer, in, versus the millennial who says, "I'm committed to working, but that doesn't mean I'm at, I'm staying at the same place. That doesn't mean I'm committed to staying in the same job or same function." Because they definitely, I mean, Anisha, what I hear from you is they definitely, um, they definitely prefer their path to be fluid, right, and to whatever works with them and what, probably whatever aligns to their values. So, Rob, I'm curious, how do, how do, what's your perspective on that? Yeah, and I, I appreciate your reshaping the question for me, but I do want to say, and I just like I agree with Anisha and Mike, uh, and just generally speaking, the the boomers, you know the reputation that I think we have, and it's true, is that we never retire, right? We, you know, that ceiling that is there for advancement, 
is real uh, because of increased life expectancies and you know people just um, working longer because they have to and things like that. Uh, and then on the other end of the spectrum, I think if you're not a boomer, um, that that uh, trying to seeking advancement maybe before you've made your bones, which is like an expression that old people use, right? Um, so it's the both of those things are very real, though they're not just stereotypes. I think, and and they they feed upon each other. As to the way you frame the question for me, you know, our mission, our global mission, is to inspire and prepare young people to succeed in a global economy. So, no matter what generation we have at the adult volunteer level interacting with young people, kindergarten through twelfth grade. We are bringing that, uh, probably um, instilling a bit of that boomer workplace expectation mentality into the mix, but it really is more about, okay, so what are your skills and assets and interests and capabilities and how do they relate to high demand careers or other type of job opportunities that you could explore and try to connect the generations that way because we know walking into that classroom that the students in front of us are going to have so many more jobs than we ever had in our lives so so that broad mission of you know uh, inspire and prepare we just we make we keep that as loose as we possibly can so that the the basic things about um, getting an education being prepared taking on responsibility and accountability and ownership for things and um, you know, the, 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 the employability skills that cross all generations, regardless of how flexible the workplace is or how you dress and all, we address those things. So we might have a plumber interacting with a group of students and they'll be sitting next to a, a, a chemist, right? And so students will be able to hear the different workplace expectations of those uh, industries and careers. That's a good insight. And you know, it's interesting, even you gave the example of having a plumber paired up with a chemist. And I think um, just to kind of sort of go to the top on that, you know, I think that's the value, right, of, of interacting and engaging and communicating with people who are drastically different from you. Right. I mean, there's a lot to be said about learning from someone who is older, who is younger, who's from a different community, who has a different ethnicity. Because I think each of us come to the table with a completely different set of experiences and, and sort of the scars from life that have taught us things along the way. Right. So I think it's that's a great way to help, um, you know, the K through 12 really um, get a, a, a diverse perspective on on the employment world. So. Um, I'll open this up to, to the three panelists, but you know, that kind of gets us into the topic about communicating and interacting. Um, a lot of times, at least the way I see it is, um, the way each generation interacts with each other is so different. And, and we talked a little bit about this in the beginning. Some of it's just because of how we were raised and really what technology was available. Um, I, I'll use the example, um, I mean, I remember going, um, to like an AT&T store or something like that to buy a phone. And the guy was like, oh, you've got to get an iPhone. You can take pictures with it. And I was like, who's going to take pictures with an iPhone? <laughs> I mean, who does that? I mean, and now it's like, who buys a camera, you know, because you use your phone or things like that. So the tech, even the technology has changed and shaped the way we think about interacting with people, the way we build relationships with people. Um, but technology is really one aspect of that. Um, so I, I'll open it up to the panelists to see, you know, what do you guys see as some of the communication strategies um, you have found to be helpful when engaging with people in different generations? Um, I, I'll start, Judah. Um, I, I think, um, I think the, the, one of the most important things is really to keep in mind that we have to meet people where they are. So knowing that we're all from different generations, from all backgrounds, it's really, it's really listening and, and, and thinking about your audience, thinking about 
who you're interacting with and who you're communicating with and really using that end state to think about how to communicate. I think um, we're all bombard bombarded all day long with information, whether it's digital or whatever, and it's hard to keep pace with information. So I think really thinking about um, how to target that communication and really think about what's important to that person and, and message it that way, I think is really important. Um, this, I'll, I'll give one example. We built a, um, within NAVI, we have a, um, what we call a total rewards portal for our employees. And we would try to group all of our uh, compensation and benefits and discount and work life practices all in one resource or one place. Um, and, and it's funny because um, one, I think it's helpful because it's, it puts things in one place and makes it easy. And we also try and make it somewhat smart so that when you log on, you know who you are and then it can target some communications. But I, I was reminded when we, um, we had a, a, an OSI person develop that for us. And when I looked at the first draft, I went, for example, I would click on medical benefits. And then I went through and read through the whole thing. I got to the end of that page of the material. And, and, and it said, Mike, did you find what you were looking for? And if I said no, it would take me back up to the beginning of that page. And I was like, no, 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 no. If I can't find what I'm looking for, I don't want to go back to the same information again. I want to, I want to phone, I want to call somebody, or I want to email somebody. And so it's funny because the vendor, it was a company that was really primarily millennials, and they and they were thinking that everybody would just look digitally to find the answer. Where I wanted to make a phone call to call somebody. But anyway, so I, again, just keeping every generation in mind. Um, when we try and, and try and, and, and communicate, I think it's important. Yeah, I would agree, Mike. Um, just keeping every generation in mind. I know we are dealing with that here, similar, and I can see it um, in many different workplaces. Um, I think millennials could be thriving in this new workplace setting um, where everything is, is digital, everything is um, either on Zoom, whereas others are, st are still struggling. I had to, I uh, hope there's no YMCA people in here, but I had to sit on a a call uh, with some administrative staff. They were running a game night on Zoom, and it was it was a complete <laughs> fail. Um, they they didn't know what to do and how to do it. Um, many of the participants um, were baby boomers, and it um, and it wasn't just like maybe this was not a good idea. Um, and and figuring out how could we uh, incorporate different communication tactics and still have a good time in the world that we're living in now. Um, it's easier for us to shoot an email or to shoot a, cha um, a chat or um, a text um, to get things across and to communicate. Whereas um, with my Gen Xers, I will have to make set up a meeting or set up a, a call or in-person meeting. So definitely trying to communicate differently with, with the different generations, but kind of keeping everyone um, engaged and involved. And how can we get the same message across um, with different communication strategies? And um, so with the, you know, it's, I'm an introvert in a very, you know, extroverted role, right? So back in the day when we had to pick up the phone and have a, a conversation or leave a live message with a human being in order to transact business, um, I did that, you know, I did it day in, day out, over and over and over again. You call the school, you leave a message for the teacher, the secretary puts it in the teacher's mailbox, the teacher doesn't pick it up till payday, they call <laughs> you back and uh, leave a message for you, right? So I, I really loved email when it came into being because suddenly we could communicate and be sure our messages were, were at least being uh, delivered and didn't have to go through all the machinations of picking up the phone, having a live conversation. So, so that's like, that's ancient uh, perspective. Now today, I think, you know, I am mostly an email person. And if I need to, if I, if I call somebody who's my generation, you know, they know it's really important. And if I text somebody who's not my generation, they know it's really important. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of how I differentiate the, you know, the exclamation point of the communication. And 
there was one other thing I was going to say, and it popped out of my head. But if we go on, if it pops back in, I'll <laughs> I'll share it. That's a baby boomer thing, you're probably pretty familiar with. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting because I um my I have a, I have two daughters, and they um they progressed in their age where you know you think about it. I don't know, maybe I forget when FaceTime was invented, but you know. Years, five years ago, let's say, people would FaceTime each other. You didn't, if you wanted to kind of interact differently. My daughters, again, who are uh, 12 and nine, they don't even, they're like, FaceTime, that's not happening. So, like, they'll be downstairs and I'll say, you know, it's time to clean your room or it's time to um, do your homework. Of course, they don't respond. So I text them and then they don't respond. So I'll FaceTime. And then my youngest will just hang up on me because she's like, I'm not talking on FaceTime. I can't do that. <laughs> you know, so it, it, you know, every generation before us and after us has, has to reshape how we, how we will communicate with each other. And I, I am, you know, Anisha, you mentioned something that I thought was a really good point in that, you know, you just, you used your example of, of a meeting that you were on and how the Zoom was sort of kind of clunky, like trying to do a game night and things like that. And I think, you know, when we think about how you build relationship and how you build connection with people so that you can grow, whether it's personally, professionally, economically, you know, part of that is, is being, and Mike, you mentioned this, kind of being where they are and going to where they are. And so, so I am curious from the panel, your guys' perspectives on um, how, how do you help people um, build that connection. Like, how do you help? How do you help the boomer who's really struggling on the Zoom call to do those things? And do you reach out? Um, or how do you help the millennial have a different way of approaching their workday and commitments and things like that? So I'm, I'm just kind of curious about how you, from your guys' perspective, how you have helped build connection um, and uh, and really help bridge the gap between different generations. Judah, I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna jump in. Excuse me. Uh, yeah, uh, I give it to the young people, right? <laughs> so it's like if, if they know the challenges of communicating with boomers, but they know how to communicate with everybody else. So I hand it off. And a, a prime example is, you know, Brianna is on this call. She's a member of our Young Professionals Board. And, you know, we had to take an, a, an event that we had done in person for 29 years and decide whether or not to do it. And uh, the only way we were gonna do it was if Brianna basically took control of producing the entire thing. And I, I had my very first conversation with her was me asking her if she would do that. And you know, she jumped right in and it was, we've gotten phenomenal feedback from that. And there were a lot of old codgers who were not really digging it, digging it me saying digging it right but um but many of them came along and i think probably the the greatest uh feedback that i got from that experience was my predecessor who participated in it who emailed me later that night and said uh you were really bold this evening rob you <laughs> took you took a huge risk and it really paid off and the only thing I did was ask Brianna to do it, to lead it, right? That was pretty bold. He was right. It was really bold for me to do that, but it was totally the right decision and one that I won't hesitate to make again. <laughs> I, I, I agree. I, I like to call it um, reverse mentoring because um, I know us millennials, we love to we love to connect with a supervisor or a boss, like as a mentor. Um, we love that feedback. We love that guidance. But we also love when they look to us to learn different things. And so um, I, I enjoy when um, someone asks me how to run a Zoom call or a Zoom conference. Um, I love, you know, teaching or educating people who are not familiar with that or generations that are not familiar with that on how to. And I think it's just that give and take when it comes to the generations, um, you know, there's some things we need from our baby boomers and our Gen Xers that we need for mentoring and growth professionally, but there's some things they need for, uh, from us as well. Um, and so I, I, I personally enjoy that. And I think that's also a millennial thing. 
um, with like we 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 love to be called on to to fill those voids and to help with those needs. I'm sure Brianna was happy, Rob, when you, <laughs> um, he was like, "No problem, I, I can do that for you." When you called on her, um, I think that's that energy we love um, as millennials. You know, that's you know that's great, and it's funny you just reminded me, uh, Anisha, of um, I, I serve on this client advisory board for Fidelity and. And we had a session on inclusion and diversity one day. And it was interesting, they, they paired new entrants into the workforce with an older or more tenured person there. And with the, with, the, um, with the idea that the older tenured person will mentor and teach the younger new entrant um, the information and the, and, and the ropes, for lack of a better word. But, but he, um, not to go into a lot of detail, but the, but the mentor was talking about an incident where the young employee um, had, had a racial incident at a hotel where they were traveling to give a presentation. And, and um, he said, he said that the mentor said that was such an eye opener to me because I had no idea what, and this was a, a happened to be a young black man was the mentee. I never understood what a young black man will go through, the things I take for granted every day. And he said, I learned so much from that incident from this millennial <laughs> that you know I could I could read about it for days but just being there I learned a lot so um yeah so I I, I, um, I tend to agree with, with, with both of you guys the, the other thing too Jude I will add is I think I think all of us just need to be open um and I th uh, open to learning and open to new ideas and and Rob both Rob and Anisha spoke to that um and to be into and, and to be brave and also to be authentic you know it's okay to say, I don't know. It's okay to say, I might not be the best at this and let me give it to somebody else. Or it may be okay to say, well, let me try something new um, if, if, um, if Brianna wants to do something different. So I think, I think being open is another good way of really kind of um, helping to bridge that gap. Yeah, I, I completely agree with that. And, and something that, the, that all three of you hit upon that I think speaks to that is, I think what no matter what age you are, and we'll talk about it in the context of generations, but it could be in context of a lot of other things, but no matter what age you are, I think every individual wants to know that they are valued, right? Mm -hmm. Every individual wants to know that their own contribution, whether you're 80 or 18 or eight, that your contribution is valued and that who you are as an individual it is cherished, so, so to speak. And I think I, I think that that transcends age. It, it also goes to everything else, you know, whether it's gender identity or, or race or anything else. And so I think that's that's part of it. Is so, you know, Anisha, you gave the example of we we love to we love to have feedback. We love to have mentors. And and I think you know someone who's at the in the boomer generation. I think that's a great that's a great call to action to say if this generation loves feedback and they love to learn from people, they love to to have opportunities and be given um, chances. And that's a great opportunity for boomers to say, okay, let me do that just like Rob did. I mean, let me, let me help them with that. Cause I think in it, I think on both sides of that, it helps people know that, that they are valued. And I think at the end of the day, everybody wants that. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe we'll, let's, let's sort of peel the onion a little bit on that topic in, in the sense of, um, you know, what, practical suggestions or tips would you guys offer um, to, our, to the, our participants today on ways to um, engage and build, build those connections with each other? So maybe, maybe think about it in a practical work setting or a, think about it in a setting of um, from a career development perspective, but how, what tips would you offer our, our participants today? I, I can take that, um, Judah. Um, one thing I noticed um, with many corporations and businesses, um, and I, I, I don't, I'm in a nonprofit field, so I'm a little different, a little bit different. Um, but a lot of corporations are starting like employee resource groups, um, or like different groups. And one thing that I noticed is that these groups bring people together um, based on similarities rather than differences. So I think when you're in those different groups, you see different generations different, um, a lot of different things. And so I think those those groups are nice to have in different corporations and businesses in the workplace, um, just to bring people across different generations together to talk about a lot of things that they have in common rather than what's different. 
I think I think it's a good point, and I I think I think just on an everyday practical um, perspective, I think um, just encouraging um, employees, encouraging their leaders, or um, to really make this part of part of their work life. You know, even if, if it's at um, even if, if if at a staff meeting, you know, let's have a minute where let, let's have a minute where we talk about what's on our minds, or we talk about what's important to us, or we talk about a current event that happened. Um, I think just incorporating those conversations into the workplace, uh, again, whether it's a staff meetings or informally or or whatever, I think that helps as well. Just to help with the connection and communication. I think um, an, an, another example is if you're leading a team or if you're part of a team. Um, again, or even a meeting, just invite people to go around the room and just say a few things about themselves, just so again, the team can get to know each other a little bit better and to provide those connection points. I, th I, think, I think that goes a long ways. And basically also from a nonprofit perspective, um, you know, talking more about like the people who are on our young professionals board who have been clamoring to do more and be more involved and be more engaged with the board board. And we seem to be, uh, there seems to be obstacles to making that work the way uh, I think everybody would like it to work. And I think the perspective, my perspective is probably very different than my young professionals board members perspective is what, First of all, keep keep chipping away, keep knocking, show up, you know, raise your hand, step in, but understand the influence you've already made on me, on this organization, on our board of directors is astounding. It's hard for you to see from your perspective, from when you came in, you just want to keep doing more, 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 more. And um uh, we're pretty nimble, generally speaking, in terms of how we serve our customers, but internally, it's a little bit slower. Um, so my advice is keep knocking, keep stepping in, keep raising your hand, keep talking, keep pushing the envelope. And particularly now, you know, with, and not just us, but with organizations reducing staff and things like that, if you're a volunteer, and you can provide some real value around a certain situation, kind of like what Brianna and Danae and uh, Ruby did, um, that, you know, that's golden. And it will, it will help change our organization for the better. So just keep doing it. That's good. So I kind of heard a few different things. Participate or lead ERGs or employee resource groups is a great way to connect. Um, participate and engage and really just meet each other. I mean, Mike talked about this, going to where they are and sort of taking the risk. And, and, and I love the way Rob said it, just show up, right? I mean, it sounds so simple, but showing up and being willing to, um, to volunteer, to engage with people, to give ideas, being willing to, um, to listen and to learn from others who are different. Um, we're gonna, I'm going to have one last question or topic, but uh, before we do that, I want to open it up that if folks on the phone have questions, um, feel free to kind of think about those, write them down, or you can put them in the chat and we'll come back to them in just a minute. Um, but our last question, I, I, think it's, um, I think it's really important for us to, to recognize sort of the state that we're in um, between COVID um, and all the mishigas that comes with that. <laughs> <laughs> um, all of the anxiety that that creates, um, the economic challenges that that creates, and then you pair that with the continued racial injustice that we continue to have out there, right? Um, we, com we combine that with other, what I'll call social unrest, things happening, um, personal things that we were already going through before all of this started, and it's a tornado of of emotions and, and it's a tornado of things that can that can come out of it. So my question for the panelists today is, you know, how do we navigate during these times and have hard conversations? And how do we do that in the context of um, working with people from different generations, right? Um, you know, we have some, you know, some generations probably have a, a particular view on the social unrest or the racial injustice that we see. Other generations have a very different perspective 
um, on COVID and, and is it real and is it not real? And you know, so there's there's a lot with that, but I'm, I'd love to hear your guys' perspectives and your opinions on how do we navigate those conversations and, and what suggestions do you have? I, I, I'm a, I'll jump in real quick. And I think, um, I, I think the first thing, Judah, is to really be, um, I'll go back to really being open and authentic and really um, being patient with people. I think, I think our employees, our friends, our coworkers, I think we're all going through a lot. And I think to, to check in with people all the time, how are you doing? What can we do to help? Um, just really um, um, being open to kind of seek and understand where folks are. So then, so then you know how to direct your efforts a little bit more. But I think sometimes people just need a helping hand. Then they need an empathetic ear. They need, um, they need some encouragement. So I think if we can do that and just be allies to each other, I think, I think that's one thing to help us going. I think the other thing is to really reinforce just all of the help that's available from a mental health perspective, whether your company offers it or whether you wanna go out on a website and look for things. Again, just remind people um, if you need professional help, uh, which we all do from time to time, that it's okay. And just to, re to reinforce that message. I would, I would agree. I think um, one of the things is creating a culture of a, a safe space culture. As, um, as a team director, I think my number one priority, especially during this time, is to make sure all of our young people have a safe place where they're able to communicate, share their thoughts, have share their feelings without judgment. Um, now my day, now I day, and I look, I was like, is there, is that a, is that a space for me? here in my workplace. And so I ask that question a lot. I think a lot of people are starting to ask that question, do we have a safe space in our work, our workplace um, where we're able to share our thoughts without fear of losing our job? Um, and so I think creating that that culture where um, it's, it's, a, it's safe. Um, I think people spend most of their day working um, and this is where we spend most of our time. And so just making sure that there is um, resources available um, and that people feel feel safe while they're there. I, I echo everything uh, that Mike and Anisha said, and I think the, to hit on the authenticity, you know, um, what we're experiencing right now is all very personal to every individual, and to and I'm not knocking anybody. Right, everybody's trying to deal with this in whatever way they can, but to use the term kind of corporate knee jerk response, you know, there, there's because something has to be done, uh, everybody's doing something, and not all of it is authentic. Mm -hmm. So, um, I'm very fortunate that I, you know, I have a small crew here, <laughs> and, um, you know, I just had a come to Jesus meeting. And I talked about how this is impacting me personally and my own healing journey as a white man in America. And I, you know, I told my truths and allowed myself to be very vulnerable in a situation where, uh, you know, I was taking a risk, but hopefully the example that that is setting is that is okay for other people in the organization to do the same thing. And, you know, we are accepting some stuff from our parent organization on guidance around this, but I think nothing is going to be, nothing's going to be revisiting that conversation on a regular basis. And as Mike put it, you know, checking in with people, but, but checking in with people in our small little group here, on a very personal level around all of these topics where people don't have to fear that they're going to, um, you know, be, there's no retribution for whatever you might share and that we just manage through the conversations. And frankly, I don't think anybody in my team here would ever say anything any more potentially offensive than what I shared that day, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so, so the safe space to speak it, it, it goes on both sides of things. It's not just about a group of, you know, people who all want to 
talk about there's a lot of censorship going on is really the point that I'm making and that safe to communicate no matter what your opinion, experience, hopes and aspirations are and finding a way to work together in these little micro units. It's the only way the, the bigger country is ever going to get there. Yeah, I agree. That that's very true. I think you guys have brought up some very relevant things um, that we can take back in terms of creating that safe space, being authentic. I mean, people can smell from a mile away if it's not authentic. <laughs> um, you know, checking in with people, right? Not being afraid to just check in and say, "How are you today? What can we do? What can we do together? Right? How can we work on this together?" Um, and Rob even you saying, just understand that people come into this from a different perspective, right? Um, and I think, I think that those um, experiences that you guys have shared goes a long way. So, um, so thank you for that. Um, I do see one question I'm gonna ask real quickly um, is if uh, our panelists can give examples of generational gaps that you guys have faced and how you handled them, um, if, and if you, per, if you would have preferred them to be handled differently. I hope I captured that question correctly. So jump in if I didn't. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. I can just share, I think for me personally in my career, I think I see a lot of, um, I have to, my, myself had to become more open-minded to the demographic that I work um, with. Um, like I work with teens, so, I get many different things every day, each day, where someone from a, a different generation may not understand um, some of the things that a student may go through. And so there has been some generational issues just based on just understanding how we were raised and of how we should handle situations with our Gen Zers. Um, and so, because uh, they're a whole new, new group <laughs> that's emerging. Um, and just how do we handle different situations um, with them? And so I think it goes back to just being open, open-minded, kind of meeting people where they are, um, eliminating biases, uh, just those things all come into play when it comes to just generational gaps. And those just some specific examples, a small specific example of how we had to jump hurdles here with handling situations um, just by, by bias and generation and some of the things we were accustomed to and how, how we should handle situations, so. Yeah, I, I, I wanna echo that as well. I think, um, um, you know, I, I think, again, being, being open um, um, and really, um, I, I, what has helped me is, is really sometimes, you know, before I get annoyed with something from another generation that I may not like, I, I always wanna, I always pause and take a minute and, um, and give myself um, a minute to reflect and to think before I respond. And that's been just a helpful technique, I think, in really um, making sure that I respond, I think, in the most effective way. I, I, I think um, telling someone, um, uh, always seeking to understand first, again, is, is always important. Although sometimes it comes down to, <laughs> right now, um, this is the way it has to be done, so you're gonna have to meet us halfway and do it this way. You know, when, when I talk about my sons a lot, when we're at the dinner table, um, they cannot have their phones on. They have to put the phones on the shelf. That's just the way it's gonna be. You have to meet us halfway on this one. Um, but other times I think it is, um, you know, again, just being open. Yeah, and my thoughts uh, are, are a bit similar. I feel like w when I have second guessed my own uh, decision about how I approach something, it was usually because I didn't follow my regular uh, MO, you know, because uh, my instinct is if, if an associate of mine comes to me with a question, they already know the answer. Uh, you know, they're really seeking uh, my opinion or vantage point or trying to see how well what they want to do aligns with what my answer is going to be. So I'm always better off when I just follow my normal, hey, so-and-so is coming to ask me a question about X. They already have an idea about X. They may have thought this whole thing through. So my question back is, 
well, there's this parameter and that parameter, but what were you thinking? And that's, you know, that's true across all generations. If, if, you, if you could be in that moment as a leader and let the questioner provide the answer, and then you can just say, let's, you know, let's take it out for a spin. Let's see how it goes. <laughs> or take complete charge of that, Brianna. It's all here, right? That's a, I mean, that's a great perspective because I think that that empowers people that, you know, if it's your employee in this example, that empowers your employee to feel like, okay, I, my instinct was right. So therefore I, I can, I can sort of trust it and go forward with it. Um, it also gives you as a leader the opportunity to go, your instinct's right, but, you know, tweak this and, and now go forth and prosper, you know, so it's, that's good. Um, one last question. Um, and this is, I like this one. Um, since COVID-19 started, there's, uh, uh, she's been extremely impressed with how older generations have embraced technology. And I think that's, you know, you got to work with what you got. Um, <laughs> the panelists touched upon this, but are there technology platforms that people have seen that have been easier um, than others when working remote? So and I, th I think this is a good question because I think, you know, prior, you know, nine months ago, I think the generations probably were using two different sets of technology to interact. It's just the way it was. And so, from our panel's perspective, have you guys seen a couple um, tools sort of rise to the top to say, you know what, this seems to be a blended technology that's working for people? I feel like Zoom is the default. I feel like Zoom has become, yeah. whether you like it or not, people are using it. Um, I, and I will say from, from my perspective, um, at Navient, when we rolled out, you know, we had, you know, almost 6,000 employees that started working remote within a two and a half week period. And that was nuts to get to that. Um, and we're talking about everybody from the professional to the processor to the call center. And that was, and, and with, within that, we had multiple subsidiaries who all had different technologies. And all of a sudden now we had to go, go home, but still collaborate and be effective and be productive and, and get along, right? <laughs> um, so I think for, I'll say for, for Navient, you know, I think the one or two technology um, items that have kind of risen to the top for us a little bit, because we don't use Zoom, ironically, um, would be uh, like a Microsoft Teams. I mean, I think for us, we had to advance our rollout of Microsoft Teams just because of COVID. I mean, it was, it was not gonna be out until later. And so we were still using Skype and things like that. Um, but Microsoft Teams really became a place where we could roll it out quickly and we could roll it out across different security levels and all that kind of different stuff. And so for us, I would say that's one technology that, that uh, we've had to use. Now, not everybody's embraced it. Not everybody turns their video on and all that jazz, but, but that's been for us one collaboration tool that's worked. I agree. MS Team is what we use across Junior Achievement, and uh, I find it's very challenging to use other platforms once Teams is on <laughs> yours, though. So um, that's fraught with things once uh, once you have that installed. If you're trying to use WebEx or Go to Meeting or something, I don't think Teams likes those. But if you're operating within Teams, it's it's very effective. Yeah, I was going to. Um... As, as Judah pointed out as well, um, so we use Teams. I think it's been very effective. You know, I think um, I've run into problems with, with Zoom. I know a lot of companies use that, but when you're on your own company network, a lot of times Zoom doesn't work for, work for me. So um, I think Teams is good from that perspective as well. Uh, I, I think the key though is whatever, whatever you use, just make sure that you reiterate all the components and how to use it effectively with the folks using it. Don't just throw, throw it out there and say, hey, use Teams. Make mm -hmm. sure everybody understands all the features, make sure they and do it over and over again so it becomes secondhand to folks that they're really utilizing it the best way. And, and on the top of that, I would say even FaceTime. I, previous to COVID, I was not a FaceTime person, but now I, it's amazing how easy it is. And so I use it all the time now. Just if I can't get to the computer, I, I FaceTime. And I think that's great as well. So one, do we have, I don't know, Helena, do we have one more time for questions or? I'd say we probably take one more question then we go. Okay. Right now. All right, cool. Um, so one other question, uh, what recommendations do you have to build tolerance? And I think it's like, tolerance is 
raw topic, um, to build tolerance and understanding among generations during COVID, um, especially with people who may or may not have children uh, or people who, and I think to kind of add on to the question, you know, for people who have different personal situations that they're having to navigate through. So how, question is, how do you, what recommendations do you have to build tolerance and understanding between the different generations? You know, I'm gonna throw in one thing. I am, um, I initially talked about ERGs, employer resource groups before. And I think um, I talked to some companies where, where, they, where when you have an ERG, to really make sure you connect with them on an ongoing basis. So if there, if there was a COVID crisis, go to each of your ERGs and say, hey, what can we do differently to make it better for this population people? If you wanna put out a new communication, go to each, each ERG and say, hey, I wanna put this communication out. What do you think? What am I missing? What do we need to say differently? So I think you utilizing that group, if you have it, is very important. Um, if you don't have ERGs, then obviously, you know, maybe doing some roundtables or some focus groups uh, on an ongoing basis. Again, just to kind of keep topics in front of them and always engage them to get their perspective on what's the best way to move forward. Yep. Well, uh, I'm going to close this out today, but let me um, just say thank you to Anisha, Mike, and Rob for your time today. Um, thanks for volunteering your, your insight and your experience and um, really sharing with us what you've learned. Um, I mentioned at the beginning of the call that I think each of us come to the table with a set of scars and experience that we've learned over our lifetime. And so thank you for sharing that insight with us. Um, and thank you to um, our attendees who joined us today. So I appreciate it. Um, Helena, I'm going to turn it over to you for the next step.